Hello, my name is Stanford Gibson. I am the sediment transport specialist on the HTC RAS team. And today we're going to talk about 1D, 2D inline modeling. How you're going to model if you want to take float and stage directly from a 1D model inline downstream to the 2D model or vice versa. You know, so far, everything what we've done as we've dealt with interactions between 1D and 2D models has been you know, mainly the, the 1D model is in the channel and the 2D model is in the floodplain or the overbank. And so as the flow gets out of the channel, then you put it in the 2D model to see what happens in the floodplain. But another common use case for 1D, 2D modeling is you have a 1D model and then you hand off the flows and stages down to the 2D model downstream. Or vice versa, you have a 2D model that wants to hand off to a 1D model downstream. Or you could have both, right? Now, this is a pretty trivial case, but you know, here's a more realistic example. You've got a 1D model coming into a small 2D area and then going back out into a 1D model. And so you know, the, the most common use case for this is you've got a you know, reach scale or regional scale 1D model. And so you don't want to model the whole region as 2D, but you have this one particular region internal to your 1D model that you would really like 2D resolution on. Maybe it's a junction, um, maybe the hydraulics are so so multidimensional that you feel like you can't get them right unless you use a 2D model. Uh, or more likely, you want to do some sort of flood risk analysis here or some sort of ecosystem hydraulics here where you want to resolve the two-dimensional map of stage and velocity with a lot more resolution than the 1D model would give you. But outside of that footprint, the you know cross-section average stage and depth and velocity are going to be just fine. And you want to leverage the runtime of the 1D model everywhere else. So you're going to model 1D, 2D inline. And that's great. That's a powerful tool for your toolbox. But what we find is that a lot of people don't do this because they get frustrated with instabilities at the boundaries. And so what this module really is going to do is it's going to help you build your toolbox for how to deal with instabilities at the boundaries so that you have confidence to do this 1D, 2D inline modeling and can add it to your overall modeling skill set. And so we have just really three takeaways from this short module on how to do this. The first one is that you want to make sure that you resolve any spatial discontinuities at the boundary. And what we mean by that is that the the location and bathymetry of your cross section and your 2D boundary condition have to be identical. Second, you want to be aware of temporal discontinuities and do, do things to mitigate them. And what we mean by that is you, you already know that we don't solve 1D and 2D at the same time. We solve 1D first and then 2D. And so if you've got relatively separate models where you have the 1D in the channel that just kind of hands water off to the 2D over there, that's not a big deal. Um, you do the 1D and then the 2D. But if it's all in line and the hydraulics are interacting in the same channel, it becomes a bigger deal. And so every time your 1D model runs, it's running with an old 2D stage at this shared boundary condition, which can cause instability. And we'll get to how to deal with that. And then third, there are actually some things about RAS where you can make output choices that will actually mask the instability. And so we want to make sure that you understand how to not do that. So when there is an instability, you can see it. All right, so let's just walk through these one by one. Now let's first talk about this spatial discontinuity. And so there are four requirements for connecting a 1D model to a 2D model in line. And the first one is, you want to do that at a cross section that is fundamentally 1D, right? If you're going to pass stages and velocities and flows between your 1D and your 2D model, you want to you know, obey the assumptions of the most simple model in that exchange. And so you want to make sure that the cross section where you're making that handoff is 1D. And so, you know, here's an example of a one of these 1D, 2D models where you actually have multiple 1D models coming in and going out. And then you have this really complex 2D model where you're resolving the junction. Now, what you'll notice here is that every place where you're going between the 1D and the 2D model is kind of fundamentally one dimensional. We don't cut the model off in a place where the flow is already two dimensional. We're handing it off at the one dimensional cross sections. And so some reasons you would do this is if you've got kind of a one dimensional channel going into a bay, an estuary or an alluvial fan. Well, you're going to cut that thing off 
while you're still in the riverine portion of it before you get to the multidimensional alluvial fan. Or if you've got a complicated structure, a complicated um, junction, a sharp bend, and you want to resolve the 2D hydraulics in that complicated low structure flow field, you're going to make sure that you make your 1D, 2D boundary upstream of that while things are still relatively 1D. Okay, so first you wanna choose a 1D flow location, or at least you want to make the handoff far enough away from your area of interest that it won't matter. And so this is kind of a theme in hydraulic modeling. You've heard this in our other classes if you've taken them, is that you know, the hydraulic equations are somewhat forgiving because they're self-correcting. And so if you get your boundary condition far enough away from your area of interest, hydraulic equations will tend to self-correct as they get closer to your area of interest. And so if you have a hard time breaking off your 1D and your 2D model at a place that's fundamentally one-dimensional, well, at least get it far enough away from your area of interest that it will resolve the difficulties before it gets to where you actually are interested in depths and flows and velocities. Okay, second, you need to carefully align your 1D cross-section with your 2D flow boundary. Okay, so here is a 1D, 2D model. And you can see that we have these 1D cross-sections and we have this 2D boundary condition and you almost can't even see the, the final 1D cross-section because it is totally aligned with the 2D boundary condition. And that's the way that it's supposed to be. Because you have to make sure that those two elements have the same bathymetry. So when they're passing off flows and stages, they're, they're making the same basic assumptions. And so that's fine. You know, you'll go into RAS or RAS Mapper and you'll draw you know, one line and then you'll draw another line and maybe you'll even move the nodes around to make sure they're on top of each other. But you need to do this at a pretty fine scale. You need to zoom in and make sure that they're really on top of each other. And so you know, here's a case where they kind of look on top of each other from a distance. But as you zoom in, you see that actually they're sampling different bathymetry. Um, and if the bathymetry is steep enough, then that difference could matter. And so you want to carefully align your 1D cross-section with the 2D area boundary. But why is that important? Well, it's important because you really need your 1D cross-section to have the same station elevation data as the 2D bathymetry. And so where's the 2D subgrid bathymetry going to come from? Well, it's going to come from the terrain, right? We don't store that anywhere else. We, we pull it out of the terrain. And so your 1D cross-section needs to be using the station elevation data from the same terrain at the same location. So one thing you need to do is you need to align it. But the second thing you need to do is you need to make sure that your cross section is actually using that terrain. Because you know, the cross section uses the station elevation data that you put in there. And it could be that this station elevation data is actually from a survey or it's a blended survey and overbank data. Or maybe you pulled the station elevation data earlier and then you move the cross section and so then the station elevation data no longer reflects the terrain that's underneath it. Well, this would be really hard to figure out, um, except that Mark added a tool that makes it much easier. If you go to your cross section editor and look at that cross section that's at the boundary, you can click on plot terrain. And if there's a terrain underneath, which there is if you're doing 1D, 2D modeling, we'll show not only the station elevation data of the cross section, but of the underlying terrain. Now, these should just be on top of each other. You know, this should be a black and red line. In this case, <clears throat> your station elevation data in your cross section is not up to date. <clears throat> and so um, you're going to have a discontinuity between the black line, which is the station elevation data for your cross section, and the red line, which is the terrain that the 2D boundary is going to use if it's sitting on top of the cross section. Now, this turns out to be really easy to fix these days because in addition to this cool diagnostic tool, Mark's added a tool to help you just very simply resolve the problem. And so if you see that there is this spatial discontinuity that you know your old station elevation data does not reflect the underlying cross section, you can just push this cut from terrain button and it'll kind of absorb the station elevation data that is actually native to the current cross section, which if it's aligned with the 2D boundary will be the same. And so you can make sure that the 2D subgrid bathymetry and the cross section are using the same bathymetry so that as they pass flows and stages back and forth, the hydraulics will be as similar as possible. All right, and then there's one other thing you need to account for. You know, those station elevation data could be the same. You, know, you could have the same cross-section geometry of your 2D boundary and your 1D cross-section, 
but the hydraulics could have a discontinuity if you don't have the same roughness, right? And so you have to make sure that the roughness is also the same so that the hydraulics at that boundary are the same. All right, so the first thing you want to do is resolve the spatial discontinuity and make sure that the cross section and the mesh boundary are identical. They're both aligned in space and have the same station elevation points. But the second thing you need to deal with is the temporal discontinuity. And that's the fact that you know, the 1D and the 2D cross section, they're, they're in the same space, but they're actually lagged in time. And so you have stage information from both of these models from different time steps that are coexisting and can cause an instability. And so how does this work? Well, during the 2D solution, it, it's not a problem because the 2D solution is using the 1D stage that just happened in the same time step. Because 1D happens first and then 2D, then you know the, the 2D solution is just saying, well, hey, that's going to be my boundary condition. I'm just going to take that 1D stage and run with it, and it'll be fine. It's really during the 1D computation where things can be a problem. And so during the 1D computation, you know the, the 1D stage is current, but the 2D stage is actually the stage from the previous time step. And so the 2D stage can be stale. You know, this is kind of like going down to Mishka's and you know, rolling the dice with the day-old pastries down there, right? You can get a day-old scone and it'll, it, it'll cost you half the, the money. Um, and usually it's delightful, uh, but it's also a day old. And so it could be a little stale. And so that is also what goes on here is generally having a 2D stage from the previous time step is just fine. And it's a lot less expensive computationally to do it that way. But you know, sometimes if you're dealing with this old 2D stage and you're computing a, a 1D stage at the same location, then you can introduce some instability in your model. And so how do you know? Well, you get these classic oscillating instabilities in your hydrograph plot. And if you've done any you know, submerged lateral flow modeling, or there are actually a couple of like classic sediment cases that get you these sort of oscillating results where in one time step, the forcing goes one way, and then, then the other time step tries to overcompensate and the forcing goes the other way, and you get these oscillations. Well, that's what's happening at the stage. The 1D and the 2D stage are out of whack, and so in alternating time steps, they try to resolve. And instead of getting closer to each other, it can diverge and it can fail your model. Well, that is scientifically interesting, right? But yeah, you're at a training class. And so the question is, how do I fix it? And so there are two ways you can fix it. One is you can turn on 1D, 2D iterations. And the second is you can just lower your time step. But let's talk about iterations. So. If you go to the options menu in Unsteady Flow and down to Calculation Options and Tolerances, you get our Calculation Options and Tolerances editor, which is everyone's favorite because it's full of all sorts of obscure numbers that some of which you're going to change and some of which you won't. And one of the things we're going to do in this class is kind of walk you through all those many, many numbers. Um, and there's going to be general 1D options, general 2D options, and then there's this tab 1D, 2D options. And the question is, well, if you've got your 1D options and your 2D options. Why do you need 1D, 2D options? Well, for this, all of the 1D, 2D options are really about how you transition flow between the 2D model and the 1D model at a shared boundary. And it's about this feature, which we call 1D, 2D iterations. And so here's how this works. Um, we're going to monitor the, the shared 1D, 2D boundary, and we're going to monitor the, the stage difference and the flow difference between the two models at this boundary. And if we find that you know, the difference exceeds some tolerance, we're going to say, hold on, uh, that's too stale. We don't want to move forward with this 2D result. And so what we're going to do is we're now going to rerun the 2D result from the last time step, but with the boundary conditions from the current 1D time step. We're going to do that until the 2D result converges on the 1D result or we run out of iterations. And so this is a way to get the model to recognize if there's going to be you know, a discontinuity that could lead to an instability and resolve it during the time step. And so then the second thing you can do is, well, you can just reduce the time step, right? If the problem is that the old 2D stage is too different from the current 1D stage, well, then you can just make sure that that difference is smaller by using a smaller computational increment. And so that's just another way to deal with this. 
And so in general, either of those ways work. Um, often one of them works better than the other, or vice versa. But here's a case where the iterations outperformed reducing the computation increment. This was a model that had this instability at a one minute time step. And so Steve Piper did this. He went in and just reduced the time step to 15 seconds. And it improved, but this is still not a good solution. This is unstable. And so what he did over here is he kept the one minute time step, but then he added four maximum iterations. And so the model started to monitor the boundary and look for if it exceeded the stage or flow threshold. And if it did, it would start to iterate. And you can see here, we got a smooth, stable solution in the same time, right? Because one minute time steps with four iterations is the same computational time, except it's actually a lot faster because that's four maximum iterations. It probably won't use all the iterations for all the time steps. And so this ends up being a faster and more stable solution in this condition. Okay, so you want to resolve the spatial discontinuity, you want to resolve the temporal discontinuity, but those are kind of causal issues that we want to talk to you about. But the last takeaway from this little module is that there's also an issue with the diagnostics. You need to make sure that your diagnostics are correct so that you can figure out that there's an instability. And so the issue is, is that there are output choices you can make in RAS that will mask the instabilities of the boundaries. Again, anytime you run into this oscillating error, we run into this in sediment transport as well. You run into it in lateral structures. You can choose an output interval that will mask the instability. Here's how this works. So here's your classic oscillating instability. And you know, we've, we've computed it at a time step and now we're outputting the, the, the DSS hydrograph at the same time step. And you can see that you know, you're getting the oscillation and they're growing over time. And that is fine as long as your computation interval and your hydrograph output interval are the same. But if your hydrograph output interval is any even multiple of your computation interval, what's that gonna do to an oscillating alternating issue. Well, it's just going to choose every other one, which will either be the highs or the lows, and it will look like a smooth profile. And so you just need to be really careful not to do this. Um, or if you're having trouble at your boundary, or if you're doing any sort of modeling like this, you probably want to make sure that you do a run where your hydrograph output interval is the same as your computation interval. Now, this used to be a much bigger problem in DSS-6. You know, versions before RAS-6.0 used DSS-6, and the problem was, is this hydrograph output interval, the minimum you could use was a minute. So if you used any sub-minute computation interval, which is pretty common for a model like this, then it would automatically smooth it because it was automatically some sort of even interval. Now in RAS-6.0, we use DSS-7, and DSS-7 goes down to a second. And so you can align the computation interval and the output interval down to a second. It's only when you get sub-second time steps where this becomes a problem. But you know, a sub-second modeling time step is not unrealistic in some settings. And so, you know, how would you be able to visualize this error if you had a sub-second time step? Or if, say, your hydrograph output interval was some even multiplier of your computation interval, well, there are two ways you can get that sort of information. You can turn on the computational output, or you can just do it in mapper with the mapping level output. And so this is a tool that we have in Unsteady Flow that's really useful and isn't used a lot because it's also, you know, these files get really big and they're kind of cumbersome, but you can turn on computational level output. And what computational level output will do is it'll give you a very bare bones output of like stage and velocity. And you can, you can choose a couple of others, but it's just a couple of variables, but we'll write it to a binary file that will output every single computation increment, regardless of what your other output variables are. And so in this case, you know, we're going to output the stage at each of these cross sections every time step. And so you'll be able to resolve what's going on on the computational scale at the upstream boundary or downstream boundary, and you'll be able to see what's going on. Okay, so the computational level output is one way to do this. The other way is just doing a mapper. And so you can go in and say a, your map, you want your mapping output interval to be the same as your computation interval. And while the computational level output will give you the cross section, in mapper, you can go look at the, the 2D boundary. And so you can come here and you can right click on the 2D boundary and you can say, hey, 
I want to see the time series of stage at the at the cell faces or at this boundary face, and it will, you know, it will plot at this 2D mapping increment. And if that is the same as your computation increment, and it can it can go all the way down to the subsecond increments, then you should be able to see the instability. Okay, so you really want 1D, 2D inline modeling to be something in your toolbox. You want, it, you want it to be something that you can consider doing because it's pretty effective and pretty useful for various settings. And to do that, you need to recognize that there are these kind of three potential pitfalls that you want to have the skills to work through in order to be able to add this to your toolbox. And so the three takeaways are, you know, make sure that you resolve the spatial discontinuity that your cross sections of the mesh boundaries are identical, both in space and in the station elevation information. You know, deal with the temple discontinuity. Recognize that when the 1D model runs, it's using stale 2D stages, and usually that's fine, but sometimes it's not, so you would have to decrease your time step or iterate. And then finally, there are some output choices you can make that mask the problems. And so the model's crashing, but you're not sure why. And so just make sure that you're getting output at the same level as the computation increment, so you're not masking those instabilities. That's a very brief overview of the things you need to know to do 1D, 2D, and line modeling.